thank you everyone for attending our Navigating Relationships, um, a low protein community chat with a patient panel perspective. Um, my name is Danae Barkey and I am the Executive Director of HCU Network America. Um, I'd like to thank HCU Network America, um, MSUD Family Support Group, the Organic Acidemia Association, the PKU Organization of, of Illinois and uh, the PKU News, how much we for their collaboration in this project. Um, we have a disclaimer to read before we will launch into our meeting. This uh, meeting is not to replace the advice of your medical team and anything you should do, you should consult them beforehand. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop my share screen and then open it to Grant, um, who will be moderating today's event. Thank you, Danae. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Grant Smith. I'm the president of PKU Illinois. And Danae asked me to moderate this event. The way we're going to frame this out, uh, we have a series of topics to talk about. We're going to talk about family. We're going to talk about friends. We're going to talk about coworkers. We're going to talk about roommates. We're going to talk about dating and relationships. We're going to talk about uh, having children. And if time, um, perhaps some general questions. After every segment, we'll do a quick Q&A. So please only use the Q&A button. Do not use the chat. I will not answer questions from the chat, only from the Q&A. But after every segment, we'll look to see if there's been any additional questions asked, and we will answer those. Uh, without further ado, I'd like the panel to introduce themselves. So we're going to start with uh, Rachel, if you could unmute yourself and tell us a little about yourself. Um, I'm Rachel Pokrovsky. I'm 36 years old. I have classic MSUD. Um, I was not transplanted. Um, I have a master's in library and information science, and um, I'm married with two kids. I work as a library media specialist slash this year English teacher. So a little bit about me. Wonderful. Uh, Jeffrey and Bernadette? I'm Jeffrey Inkman. I'm 21 years old. I have MMA. Um, I have liver and kidney transplant. I, uh, I do a lot, of, a lot of fun stuff. I do cooking. I do baking, geography, music, and uh, art. So I've been keeping busy. I'm Bernadette, Jeffrey's mom. Uh, Jeffrey's doing online courses with a group called Project Autism. They accept every ability, and he's not autistic, but uh, they he's learning so much and having so much fun there. Okay. Where are you guys from? So the, the crowd Toronto. knows. Toronto? Toronto, Canada. Rachel, where are you from? I forgot to ask. Sorry, Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, Sean? Everybody, my name is Sean Haney. Uh, I'm 26 years old, from Chicago, Illinois. Um I have classical PKU and my daily fee tolerance is 900 milligrams of fee. Um, that's while taking Kuban, one of the medications. I'm going to get started up with Palenzeek hopefully in the next month. So I'm kind of excited about starting up with that. Um, right now, I am a second year medical student at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine. Um, and then I've been in a relationship for the last three years. Great. David? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm David Fischler. Um, I'm 32, uh, and I've got classic MSUD. Um, I have a PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Georgia, and I live in Athens, Georgia right now, and um, I'm working remotely with the CDC. I've been doing that for the last however long COVID's been in existence. Um, but I've been at the CDC for a little over a year and a half, um, I'll be finishing up in July. Um, and then um, I'm engaged and looking to get married uh, in June of 2022 after COVID. So oh, wonderful. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Lauren? Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Reed. I have classical PKU. My tolerance right now is about 60 to 70 grams of protein per day because I'm on Pal and Zeke and have responded very well. I live in Kalama, Washington uh, with my husband. We've been married for three years, been together for six. We don't have any children yet, but we mentor a little boy who's currently in foster care who has PKU. 
and I have a Bachelor of Arts in International Business and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Northern State University. Well, this is an incredibly well-educated group, uh, Danae, that you put together. So let's start with family. Uh, and this is an open question for everyone. When you guys go to family events, how do you navigate the, the, you know, that family event itself? Now, in, in America and in, in Canada as well, Toronto, you know, food is a very important part of social existence. So talk about what goes on at the average family event, be it a Super Bowl party or a wedding or Christmas or, you know, or a holiday gathering. Tell me about it. Rachel, I know you unmuted, so I'll let you go first. Oh, well, so, I mean, for me, most of the event type party things, like a Super Bowl party or something, we often organize it. So, you know, I actually am really big into, like, getting invested in uh, making appetizers and preparing stuff. And so I always include just, like, a couple of things that I know that I'll be able to have. You know, so that way I, I'm not really, you know, as limited. Um, and most of my friends and family know my condition, so they don't need to ask questions. And if anybody does ask questions, it's usually out of concern, like, should you really be having that third serving of Tostitos? Because <laughs> corn <laughs> chips are a little high. And so some of them know some of that, like, like fine grain stuff. But um, for the most part, um, you know, it's just, I view it as a personal thing. Like, you know, I always look to see if there's something I can have. I'll ask if they can make a separate dish if they need to. And usually like for a wedding or something, they're pretty accommodating. Um, I haven't really, restaurants, you know, again, it's just like annoying sometimes to have to ask for no nuts, no this, no that. But um, I think it's just more like me feeling bad sometimes you know personally like I have to get over that you know and over the years I've kind of gotten over it like I feel like it's I think it's them looking at me but it's really me feeling like I don't know but. David um yeah so similarly my friends and family they all know what I can and can't eat and they know if we have a family gathering gathering to have something at least potato based because I can eat potatoes to my heart's content and they're relatively low in protein um, the only time I really come up into issues is if I go to a wedding, I've realized because I've got a lot of friends now getting married, I'm getting married. Um, and sometimes you can reach them and they can figure out some of our food, but a lot of times you can't. So I, I tend to have a plan B, which might be going to a McDonald's and getting French fries after the wedding, quite honestly. Um, but I always have some kind of backup plan. Um, I was at a wedding in January and every single thing had cheese in it. Even the bread had cheese in it. Um, and I couldn't eat anything except for a slice of cake the whole night. So uh, I went to a McDonald's on the way home and got French fries. Um, but I always try to have some kind of plan B, but usually if it's a Super Bowl party or friendly, all my friends know what I can and can't eat, relatively speaking. Um, so it's usually not an issue. And then when I go out, usually I try to find something on the side dish menu because you can get lower protein stuff. Because I don't like to tell me either. I don't want to tell them I'm allergic to stuff because it, um, especially, so this happens a lot, um, I have family in Orlando, so I go with them to Disney World a lot, and at Disney World, if you say you have an allergy of any kind, the chef comes out, and that's one thing I never like doing is having to talk to a chef, because then they go find some PKU food that'll work, but I just don't like the taste of it, because I never grew up on low-protein food, so okay. I tend to try to go to the side dish menu when I'm at restaurants, if I can. All right, Lauren has her hand up. Yes, yeah, so my family has always been very accommodating. Uh, when we have events and gatherings, they always call me ahead of time, say, okay, this is what we're planning to make. Is this okay? What can we make for you? And usually it's like tater tots and some kind of vegetable. Uh, and it's even been that way lately, even though I'm on Poundsy because I've decided to stay vegan. So now they're like, okay, now you can eat more protein, but you're still not doing dairy and you're not doing meat. So what can we make for you now? So it's, it's I think it's really important that our families know what we have and maybe we try to ask them if we could bring something sometimes, uh, especially with my husband's family, they conveniently forget that I don't eat things. So I'll... I'll have to do the same thing and just, okay, I'll go to McDonald's and eat French fries. 
So, Bernadette, Jeffrey, you have anything to add? Um, you know, my, my, my family and friends are really supportive of what I can eat and what I don't eat. I bring, I bring my, if I'm going to a, a party, I would bring my own food. If we're, if we're having a dinner at home, we're having family over, I would, uh, I would make, I would make my own, I would make my own dinner because they know what I can eat, what I don't eat. So I would toast a bagel or, or have yogurt or, um, have some vegetables, have some vegetables like car like carrots or celery or cucumber. John, you're in a unique you know space. Kind of formula. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, and the formula as well. So you're mm -hmm. you're in a unique space, John, where you're busy about 20 hours a day. So how do you, you know, yeah, when so, family gatherings happen to you and whatnot, what how do you do it? So honestly, my experience uh, sounds very familiar to you know a lot of the experiences that our panelists have already shared. Um, you know, my family and my friends have always been very accommodating, very supportive, um, and very aware of my dietary restrictions. So I'm going to a family event. Um, you know, I'll always get a call from my aunt or my grandma beforehand. Be like, okay, like I'm making this for everybody else. Like, how does this sound for you? So everybody's very aware of what my dietary restrictions are. They always try to prepare something, um, separate for me that kind of like fits along with the same meal. So if it's like, if it's Thanksgiving, they'll like make mashed potatoes without, you know, adding milk in it. They'll make a side batch specifically for me. And then I'll just kind of help myself to like some corn. And, you know, my mom will also make me some like some low protein-esque uh, stuffing um, in terms of like going out to restaurants. I also don't really like to try to ask for too much, I guess. I kind of try to, work within the confines of what I, whatever I can find at the restaurant, just because I don't like making a big deal out of things. So, you know, like David said, like everybody else said, like kind of picking through the sides menu, finding what I can eat. Um, and, uh, you know, my current situation in school hasn't affected things too, too much. Um, luckily, just because I do have friends and family that are kind of cognizant of my time uh, constraints. And so they take it upon themselves to kind of, help plan out meals for me so that I don't have to like go to the grocery store and sacrifice time to like try to cook something for myself to bring somewhere else. So I'm in a pretty fortunate position. The, the era of the internet has helped so much. The amount of times we've gone and let, had to look at, you know, 10, 15 different menus before we're like, yeah, this is the place we can go. Oh, so yeah. I, I can't imagine what it was like and Rachel's laughing, what, what it was like beforehand walking in blind to a restaurant. Uh, it was like a salad and french fries, salad and french fries, to the place that salad and french fries. And you basically memorize the menus so that you know the places that you can go. Or like if it's a Chinese restaurant, it was always like rice and the vegetarian delight with no soy sauce. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, basically steamed vegetables that's it for me please thank you so today I, I was just going to say you know um the best thing that has kind of come along are these like places that have make your own type things like chipotle and now they have cauliflower rice like whoa um and like mod pizza or blaze pizza um there's so many of them now but those kind of places have really been a game changer because you're right, everything else was like, okay, what sides can we eat off the menu? Or, you know, the default French fries and salad. And that's still very much the case. So, you know, I think everyone has their their place of their favorite. Fries. Yeah, I'm told Red Robin has a lot of, you can substitute anything at Red Robin. Oh, you can make Frankenstein burgers, essentially. Like, they'll, do, they'll bend to your whim. And they won't look at you crazy at all. So it's wonderful. Um, yeah, like I want a cheeseburger, except no cheese. And instead of the meat, I want a tomato. And instead of the bread, I want lettuce. <laughs> and, and they're like, sure, whatever, it's fine with me. No problem. There was a, oh, sorry. There was a question in the, in the q and oh, yeah. So like, did, did you run into, especially with extended family, people who just didn't get it? Mm -hmm. and, and what do you do how do you approach those how do you navigate your way through the and I just think of like my big fat Greek wedding you know when the soon-to-be mother-in-law is like you're vegetarian I'll make lamb 
Like, you know, how did you manage some of the cousins, aunts, uncles who just don't understand? I bring low protein pasta. I think I can take that. Um, All right, Lauren. That definitely happened. What? Me? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Everybody froze. Sorry. That definitely happened uh, with my husband's side of the family when they met me. His mom was very meat and potatoes. So when I told her, I'm like, I can't eat meat. I can't eat dairy. You know, I can't eat a lot of high protein vegetables. She's like, well, I'll just make you a bunch of potatoes. I was like, no, potatoes have protein. She's like, what? They're vegetables. Vegetables don't have protein. So it's like we had to go through a PKU 101 for his whole side of the family for when we would go over there. And even now we went to his sister's for his birthday party and she made tacos and didn't put any, didn't make anything vegetarian to put in the tacos. She's like, well, you can have protein now. So you should be able to eat the chicken. I was like, yes, should and do are two different things. (laughs) She's like, well, you can just eat it. Like there was no rice, no beans. I mean, who makes tacos without rice and beans, but it was really frustrating to be at a family function where nothing there, I can, I can eat anything coming from my family who's always been so supportive of it. So we have to continually remind his family about it. And I think that's because they're just not used to it and they're, they're not used to having to accommodate me. So we've just started taking food with me, which she gives me flack for anyway, but because she doesn't remember or doesn't realize how important it is for me to still follow my my protein limit and 60 grams seems like a lot but when you start eating normal food it adds up really really fast yeah so today um so this is an interesting question because i think i'm the only one on the panel who was diagnosed so late so i was 10 when i received our diagnosis so it wasn't just our family like the extended family that had adapt it was everyone and you know both sides of my families were farmers so it's like that that very midwestern meat and potatoes diet um and you know still to this day our extended family really doesn't understand it they don't understand any aspect about it period um and so um you know the big thing for us with the extended family you know at, initially they were very supportive because we were so young and they're not anymore. As adults, they kind of treat us like any other adults, like figure it out yourself. Um, And so my in-laws have been amazing. They're very supportive. Um, My mother-in-law's a vegetarian, which helps tremendously, but she was just shocked after, like she started tallying up the protein on things. She goes, you really can eat a whole lot. Like even on a a low day, I'm at like 40 grams of protein. Um, you know, there's always that joke, what do vegetarians eat? How do they get their protein? Well, there's protein in everything. And so um, with our extended family, we just, you know, we, we've learned that, you know, we have to keep reminding them, you know, we're in this journey now 26 years later, and we're still reminding them. Um, I try to find out what people are bringing in advance if we're having family functions, though, um, which has really helped. Um, if I have that control, like, we had a big party for my daughter um, when she turned one, I was that parent. Um, but we try to set themes. So like we do a, either like a taco bar or like a pasta bar, things that are very easy to adapt for everyone. And so, you know, it's that make your own kind of thing again. Um, so there's always options for my brother and I both on a low protein diet, because otherwise it is very easy to get left out. So. A lot of times for family parties, we just, I I try to pre-eat a little bit so I don't get there and I'm hungry and frustrated because then I'm just miserable and no one wants to be around a miserable, hungry person the whole time. It doesn't make it fun for anyone, so. (laughs) Does anyone besides Danae in this group have a sibling or a cousin with a rare disease as well? No? Okay. So we're going to sort of table this part. My husband has a rare genetic disorder, but it's not a low protein one. Does that count? Well, yeah, it counts for sure. (laughs) Um, We're going to just take some questions from the audience. 
now and, and sort of move on to the next topic. We're already almost halfway done. So one person asked, for those who do go to restaurants and order off the side menu, do you still weigh it? Do you still do you bring your scale with you? I don't. I eyeball it. Uh, I'll be honest. I mean, I did have a scale for a while when I wanted to kind of see like really figure out how much I was having. Um, but I mean, I'm on five to 10 grams of protein a day. So, I mean, I really know the limit on that because <laughs> it's not much right, to it's play not a big with. Number. Um, so like, you know, if I have French fries at one meal, like half a serving of whatever they would give you is probably what I have generally and i i probably still ended up a little over for the day on that day anybody else i i definitely don't weigh or measure things in restaurants um what i try to do though is find like that nutrition calculator online on most of the places most places that i, I would say overall have their menu online and a lot of the chain restaurants have the nutrition available so you can kind of pre-calculate things in advance. I know there's some fluctuation. Um, I have a tolerance of 20 grams of protein a day. So it, I have a lot of more room to work with than five grams of protein. And I, I recognize that obviously it's, it's still not like, you know, unlimited. Um, but when, we, when I go out to eat, I tend to gravitate towards things that I know are really low, just because, you know, if you're gonna have that room for air, You'd rather have it with the super low things than, you know, like order asparagus, which adds up like super quick. So, you know, you stick to those really low things, like always start with a salad just because, you know, that that's a filler ha helps create that buffer. So that way, you know, when you have the things that are going to add up even quicker, you're not eating as much um, like French fries. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I just want to get the calories. Too, you know, it's hard. So let's yeah. talk about, let's sort of harken all of ourselves back to your, your childhood, your younger days. So when you were a kid and going to, like, you know, kindergarten, grade school, whatever memories that you have, how did you tell your friends or how did you tell your classmates and, and how did at that time everyone react and interact? Uh, we'll start uh, with Sean this time. Um. So from what I can remember, well, I should preface this by saying that, like, you know, all throughout my life, I was kind of like, oh, having PKU is such a drag. Like, why do I have to have this? Especially because I grew up not having any, having any friends who, you know, shared similar dietary restrictions to myself. So it was always kind of like comparing myself to them as a drag. And my parents always reminded me that, like, you know, it could be a lot worse. You could have you know, a condition that's like way more debilita debilitating. Um, so with that in mind, I never really had any sort of like shame or fear of sharing my dietary restrictions or my diagnosis with, you know, people that I would meet just because my parents, you know, raised me to not be like ashamed of it or anything like that. So, so I, would, I would never be, you know, too hesitant or scared to share my diet and my, my dietary restrictions with friends growing up. Um, I would just be like, you know, like I can't eat, you know, meat. I can't have cake at a birthday party or pizza at a birthday party for, you know, when you're hanging out with your friends in middle school or whatever. And I was fine with that. But <clears throat> the one thing I was more hesitant uh, to share was when I had to bring my formula to school with me. Anybody who drinks the Phoenix formula can probably already smell it in their heads without having it there in front of them because it's such a pungent smell. So that is the one thing that I was like <laughs> more hesitant to share with my friends outside of just any sort of dietary restrictions that would accompany, you know, having PKE. Did anyone have any, any, you, you, meant, you mentioned Sean, friends with PKU. Did anyone have any uh, friends in your, you know, your ecosystem when you were growing up that had the same thing you had? So Laura, I you did. did. Okay. Yes. Our clinic was really great. Uh, I went to the Denver clinic and they always brought all of us PKU kids together at least once or twice a month. So we could meet other kids our age with PKU. 
and my mom became friends with one of the other moms um, who baked bread and was really good at it. You know, this was way back before we could buy it from Cambrook or whatever. And both of her kids had PKU. So we would be over at their house. So it made me a little more comfortable being able to talk about it. Um, and all of my friends in school were jealous because I would always get juice instead of milk at lunch. <laughs> and whenever they would ask why, I'd be like, well, it's because I'm special. And they were like, oh, okay, that's fine. And I don't think I really talked about it very much other than oh, I just can't have it until like middle school. And actually my seventh grade science teacher asked me to speak about it when we started talking about genetics and the Punnett squares and everything. So I had to give a whole presentation to my seventh grade class. And my friends were like, what? We didn't know that's what this was. And we've known you since kindergarten. So that's when I started talking about it. And I guess I never stopped. <laughs> David? Um, so, yeah. I mean, the only real issue growing up was, as Sean said, the medicine, the formulas. Um, kids are mean in kindergarten and first grade. Um, if they see that, they say you're drinking formula. They don't understand it. And it smells pretty god awful at that time. That was 30, you know, 30 years ago. Um, but so after about a year of that, um, I eventually just um, set it up. So the last 10 or 15 minutes of lunch period, I leave early and then I'd go to the nurse's office. And in the nurse's office, I could drink in about 10 minutes or so and then go back to class. And if anyone said, why are you leaving lunch? I said, I'm just gonna go have my medicine at the nurse's office and no one really cared. Um, and I did that in middle school and high school. Also, I just went to, um, in high school, it was just the uh, attendance office because I had a refrigerator in there. Um, I'm on low flex now, so it doesn't need to be refrigerated, which is nice. But um, at the time I needed a refrigerator. So I dropped it off in the morning, go to class, and then at lunchtime, just leave early and go have it. Um, and then most of my friends, even at, even in kindergarten, they didn't really care what I ate as long as they, they, they're like, oh, why are you eating that? And I said, well, you're eating pizza and I can't eat it. So I'm eating this. And like, you can't eat pizza. And then they just felt really bad and they never really questioned it after that. Torture. What kind of torture is this? I love your story so much more than mine. I wish mine were happy. <laughs> Yours is not a happy story, Rachel. No, no. Um, yeah. So K through fifth, um, they didn't let me go to the nurse to have it because they wow. said it was um, not medicine. It was part of my lunch and it should be eaten with my lunch. And so I had to have my thermos there and be the smelly kid that nobody wanted to sit with. Um, and then in middle school, it turned into a nickname, Nectar, you know, the fruit of the gods. And um, yeah, kids used to tease me all the time about it and it never it never really went away kids some kids understood it more eventually and they're like yeah we all feel feel bad you know and respect you know what you have to go through every day and you know but I really didn't want them to feel bad for me either I just wanted like friends right. <laughs> you know what I mean like and I had a small group of friends who like didn't care but it was like it was like a big issue for so many people and I just didn't understand why it was such an issue but. yeah I should preface um, I got lucky so my mom's a nurse and actually my future mother-in-law's a nurse but my mom would not let them pull that on me yeah. she even um because she uh took a couple of years off work when I was going through elementary school and she actually worked in the cafeteria as a monitor just so she could make sure that I got what I needed to eat for, for lunch. And yeah, my mom, we went to a Schlossky's when I was little, I remember. And I just wanted bread because I can't really eat anything at Schlossky's. So I'm like, I just get bread and some potato chips. I'll make a sandwich. And um, they refused to sell it to me. And my mom actually, um, she got her lawyer friend and she threatened to sue me over it. So my mom wasn't going to let anybody do that to her kid. Yeah. So. The, the, the amount of times, like when I was dieting and I don't have PKU and I'd go to a restaurant and say, I just want this and I don't want fries. And I know this is kind of antithetical to our conversation, but the, the waitress would be like, well, we can't do that. I'm like, you can't just take the fries and put them on another plate or in the garbage. I will pay for them. Just don't give them to me. And like, they looked at me like I had four heads. So I totally understand what your mom's going through. Yeah. It, it's ridiculous. It was so, actually nice though. Uh, Schlosky sent me a baseball cap and apologized. <laughs> <laughs> Danae? I, so this this isn't so much about me, but it's also it, so my background actually with everything started because 
there was no support for home assistant area patients. And where I finally found support was with Grant and the PKU organization of Illinois, which I was part of for, for quite a long time. Um, and one thing I wanna just mention to anyone listening is the National PKU Alliance has a list on their website, um, HCU Network America does too, of all the different PKU and allied disorder groups around the country. And I highly recommend that you reach out to them. Even if you don't have PKU, I have home assistant and I did this, um, and find those local or regional groups and join them. Um, they, it's, you know, they might not have the same disorder as you, but having people that understand the low protein diet and formula, it's so important to have that kind of support um, regardless if you're in your 20s, 30s, or if you're a child, or if you're a parent, because, you know, we're all in these similar situations, which is why I put together this panel. And so um, I want to make sure that people know of that resource. So if you are a parent or an adult, you know there is community. Um, the internet's great for it, but uh, I think we all need to be able to at some point <laughs> meet other patients in person and those regional groups are, are a wonderful place for them. So we have a question from our, our favorite uh, Irish representative, Bernadette Gilroy. So welcome, welcome Bernadette. We have Europe on the phone. An adult with PKU once spoke to me about having suppressed feelings of disappointment around mealtimes, parties, et cetera, keeping a smile on your face, even though that was only on the outside and it really wasn't on the inside. And I've always encouraged my child to share feelings of disappointment it's important to acknowledge our feelings, no matter what it is. Is this something you guys can relate to? And an open question. I, I would say definitely yes, because you know you expect, especially your family, to be supportive, and you know they they aren't always. Garrett and I were definitely teased by our own siblings for the longest time when it came to our food and our formula, until one day we just got sick and tired of it and said, you know what, you're going to sit down and actually eat a meal just like us, our bread, our pasta, our formula. And one of our brothers, I, it's still, this was so many years ago, and I laugh now because it still to this day sticks out so well. He couldn't even choke down, like it, this was before bread actually, like it was like bread in a can. I don't know yeah, how many of remember us that. remember that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> he got through like not even two bites and he ended up, like going and spinning out into the garbage can. And he's like, I will never bother you again. And I think it was, you know, they, they don't realize how that impacts your feelings because this is not a choice for us. This is what we have to do. And it, you know, you want that support from your family and you don't never want to be left out. And it is good to acknowledge those feelings, but you also have to kind of find a way so you don't feel that way. You know, for me, it was kind of, from a young age, I started doing the cooking in our family. I was 15 when I took over all our family cooking. And that way I had the control over what everyone was cooking and their meals looked identical to mine. I mean, we, it, it, it was really, it made me feel like, oh, this is, this is normal now. Like they're, the only thing that did, was different was maybe their pasta, our toppings were the same. They eat a lot of vegetarian meals because that's what I was pretty much eating. Um, with, you know, the accommodations of the pasta and the cheese and whatnot. But um, you know, I think you just have to find a way to reconcile it with yourself and to others. I, I know that's easier said than done, but this is our whole life. And we can't just go spending our entire life feeling like we're, we're third wheel to, to everything else. Um, so Bernadette and Jeffrey, anything you'd like to add before we move to the next topic? Growing up, what was it like? Uh, you know, growing up, because I was always tube fed, I, I never had any problems. You know, my friends were always supportive about asking questions about, you know, how, why can't you eat? Why can't you eat food? Because, because, because I'm on I'm on special diet. So I I, I, I never had really any problems. The only thing I can think of was uh, was that in elementary school he was taken to a different classroom 
and um, he was supervised by a nurse because he was too fed. He, she just watched him. So he felt that he missed out. He wanted to be, and he couldn't rush it because he can't tolerate it. It right. would just come back up. So he did take time and he wanted to get out there and play with his friends. So he learned quickly after his transplant to throw some chocolate syrup in it and drink it. So when he started high school, he started, the, he didn't have a nurse following him. He drank it in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. So that was a game changer. That's chocolate syrup is a game changer regardless. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about for, so the reason I wanted you to ask is the next topic doesn't really revolve around you guys so much, but we'll talk about leaving the house. And I mean, not leaving the house to go to dinner. I'm talking about leaving the house to go to higher education or to get your first apartment. And now you have a whole group of people who you've never met before, right? In, in either your first college dorm or your first apartment building. Walk us through that. And we'll, we'll start with Rachel because Rachel, so I'm like near tears listening to your high school story. So I'm hoping oh. it gets better here in the college era. Yeah, actually. So let's it, talk about that. It did. I, I would say that, um, yeah, college, my mom was, I want to say she was hoping that maybe I would not stay at college. Like, I think she, in the back of her head, thought that maybe um, I would, like, commute like she did, especially because of MSUD, and, like, she wasn't really sure how she was going to navigate it or help me navigate it, but she was just like, you know what, if it's what she wants to do, she shouldn't limit herself, like, I don't want to get in the way, and I ended up at UMass Amherst for undergrad, and, um, you know, it was an hour and a half commute, so it was far enough that she would only come like every other weekend or whatever, you know, like what she wasn't going to push it maybe even just once a month. Um, but I think the roommate situation for me, I never looked at a roommate. Maybe it's because I'm an only child, but I never looked at a roommate as someone that I would rely on for anything. And I think that was maybe a good thing because um, like they're also college students figuring it out for the first time. You know what I mean? So like you move in with some freshmen, you know, they may not even have their head together and what you're going to expect them to remind you to have your shake. No, you're not. You know what I mean? So like, you know, for me, well, more, more so they are you know, people bringing crates of ramen noodles into the dorm. You're bringing boxes okay. of well, formula. And yeah. so you're going to have to explain <laughs> that. So, sure. more, you know, talk about that. Like, yeah. So I don't know, I guess, the weird thing was that um, the way we decided to handle the formula was kind of unique because I didn't want to have to refrigerate it. Um, and I didn't want to have to make it um, up in advance. And I didn't want to have to be in my dorm sometimes during the day to like get it. So we made little individual Ziploc bags <laughs> for like individual meal size portions that I would pour into like a Minute Maid cup or a Nantucket nectar glass bottle, and I would mix it with water, shake it, chug it, and go. Like literally, I would have the packs in my backpack with me and like a plastic bottle or glass bottle, and I would drink it before class in the middle of the day, like, I, you know, on, on the run, walk between classes, between the cafeteria. Um, so it was like, I mean, I think the only question was they wanted to make sure that they knew it wasn't drugs or something. Because yeah, there were these little bags of powder. <laughs> but that, that was really like about it as far as like they, they weren't really curious because it was just it was kept in like uh, Tupperware under my bed so it, it wasn't like in the way or like on display or anything um, and I think that you know yeah I'm not going to share their ramen noodles they probably want to know why um, and why all my snacks look a little different but um, I don't know I was never really worried about that as much I don't know maybe I should have been Sh Sean so I went to undergrad at University of Illinois in Champaign and um, being from the Chicagoland suburbs, I had a ton of people from my high school go to UIUC. Uh, my first year I stayed in the dorms and I roomed with my best friend from all throughout my childhood. So it really wasn't any sort of issue bringing my formula to school and like making uh, each serving in my dorm room every day because, you know, this guy's known me for years now. He knows the ins and the outs of my diet, so didn't feel any sort of embarrassment, uh, you know, kind of managing my diet around him or feeling like I needed to explain anything to him. So right. that kind of helped 
ease my transition into moving out of my parents' house uh, during my first year. Um, in terms of eating, when I was living in the dorms, um, you know, even though there's like 40,000 people who go to UIUC every single year, um, there aren't like a whole lot of individuals with PKU who go through that school. Um, luckily, I was able to set up a meeting with one of the dorm supervisors or dorm managers. I don't know the exact title, um, but they got me in contact with the chef of my of my dorm, and they gave me his direct number. And so I was able to like kind of like text them and plan out meals um, throughout the week. And you know, he would order low protein food for me that he would then prepare specifically for me. Um, so I had a really nice setup throughout my first year away at school. Um, so I feel pretty lucky in that regard. And then, you know, throughout the remainder of my years at school, um, I joined a fraternity during my first year at school um, and lived in the house during my second and third years. There was a private chef who worked in the house and prepared our meals for us. So again, I also had access directly to the chef and he would kind of help, you know, prepare meals specifically for me throughout the week and plan things out. So, um, you know... <laughs> I had that available to me. I still was learning to live on my own. And so I still kind of fumbled my way through making that transition from parents' supervision 24 seven to kind of managing things on my own 100% of the time. Um, so there were some challenges, you know, transitioning to living outside of the house. Um, but I was pretty lucky to have, um, you know, roommates who were understanding of my condition and um, accommodating of it. And then also having a uh, nice structure and organizational support from the university and my fraternity house uh, throughout my first couple of years at school, which helped, you know, support me through that transition from, you know, living with mom and dad to kind of figuring things out for my own. Did I? So I have to say Sean's experience with college is what it really should look like. For patients on a low protein diet, anyone who does go should, you know, you're paying a hefty fee to go to college. You should be working with the school and the cafeteria, the dorm, whoever it may be, to have those accommodations in place. And legally, they have to. Unfortunately, when I went to college, I didn't know that. And their accommodation was, well, you don't have to pay for the meal plan. And I just took that because I was like, what are they going to do? Because um, my experience with people cooking low protein for me was, was terrible prior. Um, so, but then as I went to school, I realized how big of an issue that was because I was working full time in college. So I was gone all the time. I mean, I, you think about college life as it is and then trying to like throw in a full time job into the mix. There was no time and it had horrible consequences for me. Homocystinuria blood clot is one of the consequences, and that's where I ended up because I, I wasn't able to follow the diet to a T. And, you know, having someone, you know, take that burden of the food part off my plate would have been phenomenal um, because it's just too much to juggle trying to, you know, going to school is, is enough to juggle on its own, but then having to also throw in a job it makes it next to impossible. One of the things I would highly recommend to patients um, of any low protein disorder is that you make, you know, school is important and that should be front and center, but your health really should be the thing that comes first because you're not going to be able to come back from those things. And I was very fortunate that it, it didn't have longer term side effects than it did because strokes is also another thing that could have happened and I wouldn't be sitting here. And so, you know, may, don't let your health be second fiddle to school, to work. Um, and that's at any point in life. Um, be an advocate for yourself, especially in college. Again, MPKUA, HCU Network America have resources available. I'm sure the MSUD support group also does. And so um, I would really look at those if you are going off to college and, you know, follow in Sean's example, get the cafeteria <laughs> to work with you. They are legally obligated to, um, 
I, I would never want anyone to follow in my footsteps. And so just make sure your voice is heard and get those things in line before you head off to college. So that way you're not learning after um, you're there, how difficult it is. David? Um, so um, to piggyback, I was gonna talk about what Sean said, but first with Danae, um, that goes for, you gotta put your limits on yourself too. Um, a couple of years ago, I was finishing up my dissertation. Um, the last week of that, I was just so stressed out. I was eating and I wasn't sleeping the whole week and made myself very sick. Um, so you got to really take care of yourself too and know your limits when you're doing whatever educational study for a test. Um, when I was at Georgia Tech, all-nighters, I knew I couldn't do. I really couldn't do that. I needed to sleep because um, stress levels have always driven my protein levels up for some reason. So um, that's something you have to focus on. And that one week taught me I exceeded my limits and I need to make sure I'm eating, getting my calories in and um, just not being as stressed as I was. Um, Cause it was, it was pretty bad when I got in the hospital. Um, but um, they did a good job when I was there. I got flushed out. I was out of the hospital in like 24 hours, much better. Um, Cause my fiance is like, no, I'm taking you to the hospital right now. Um, and I fought her a little bit on that, but she was right in the end. Um, but to go back to what Sean said, um, so when I went to tech, I got, I went to Georgia Tech and I got lucky. Um, I have a twin brother. So he was actually my roommate the, my first year at Georgia Tech in my dorm. So he knew all about my disorder. And even growing up, him and my, so I have a twin brother and an older sister. They both knew about my disorder fully growing up. And I mean, my mom was a nurse, so she instilled them. Hey, you don't want to be on his diet, so help him with it. Um, so they were really good. So I didn't have to worry about a roommate. Um, as far as taking my medicine, um, I went home every two or three weeks because I lived about 45 minutes away and I made individual daily packets of my powder and I just made, I just mixed it with water every morning. Um, luckily I have low flex now, which is already pre-made liquid. So they're just individual packets. So it's much easier to deal with. Um, but so, and then anyone I met when I was at Georgia Tech, I pretty much told them right away what I had and what my limits were. And if they were going to support me, I honestly didn't want to be friends with them. There was no point in me wasting my time. Um, but I had a great bunch of friends. Um, I was in the marching band, so I had a little community there. Everyone in the group knew what I could eat, what I couldn't, and they were more than willing to help me. So that was really good. Um, the one thing that helped me the most probably when I was an undergrad was the, before I started my first years, I went to the Disability Resource Center, and they handled anything I needed. Um, if I was going to be in the hospital, I contacted them and they contacted my professors. Um, luckily, I only did that once when I was at Georgia Tech. Um, I had a uh, final exam and um, I caught a virus the two, a day or so before. So I was puking my guts out the morning of the exam, went and took the exam anyways, ended up in the hospital that night, um, ended up getting a 42 on the test. And my test average was about a 93 in the class. So uh, they contacted my professor and he gave me a a retest, but it was a much harder version. And I still got like a 93 on it. And he's like, oh, I guess you were sick, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, the Disability Resource Center, um, them and the Dean of Students can be, really be your advocates for you whenever you start college. Every college is gonna have pretty much both of those departments. And they're really your key to, and, and then you can tell your professor, and they'll tell you this at any of those centers, you can tell your professors. I, I, you I, I don't mean to cut you off, David. Yeah, no, we got one more topic and we got six minutes. So, that was really like, those are really, really good stories. Every, every one of them. And it's all good feedback. Talking to the chef, going to the departments, and but really advocating for yourself. So let's talk about advocating for yourself while you fall in love. So you're, you're David, you're about to get married. Rachel, you are married. Lauren, you are married. Danae, you are married. Now, we, we've all fallen in love first time, and you'll do anything. So what... You know, what was, when was the breaking point? When was the part in, in relationships that you had? Maybe not the one you're currently in or other ones that have maybe broken bad because of it being who you are. Or when did you just say, this is who I am? This is what I do. Is it an upfront conversation or do you wait a little bit? Talk about interpersonal relationships. Um, and we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Rachel. Okay, well, um, I mean, I had a high school relationship. I don't remember any issues with that relationship as far as the MSU days. Um, it was like a non-issue. And maybe it's because, you know, 
we were friends at school, you know, you go out to eat, it's not a big deal if you make a choice to get a salad and fries. I would never have the shake at the restaurant. Do you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't really like, I would say like a real relationship. And uh, in a way, you know, looking back at it, but like, um, you know, we cared for each other, but in college, um, you know, there's a lot of like fake relationships, people you don't really maybe care about until you get to know that right person. But like, I think I knew, I met my husband in college. I, I knew he was the right person for me because when I was sick and not feeling good, he was the one willing to like get the powder and add the water and didn't even flinch uh, at the smell and just handed it to me like it was no big deal, you know? And like, that was the kind of thing. And, you know, like when you're out eating, like on our first day, we were out eating and I explained why I was ordering a salad. And I was like, I don't want you to think I'm that girl that orders the salad. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> that was kind of like, you know, it had its own stereotypes with it that were not me. And so I explained to him and I was like, so, and he goes, well, that just makes you interesting. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> and from that point on, like we were pretty much together ever since. So. Okay, Lauren? Okay, that's a really cute story. That makes me happy. Um, my husband is was kind of the same kind of deal. I met him at a kickboxing class. Actually, we had a, like a fitness club on campus. So we met there and I actually fell down the stairs of my apartment building and cracked my pelvis the next day. And he wow. came and like slept on my couch to take care of me. And I was like, okay, since you're here and you're taking care of me, here's what you need to know. And he's like, oh, okay, that's fine. Because his genetic disorder, although it's different <clears throat> for the medication he has to be on, he has to be on a special diet as well. He's like, so I totally get it. And the next morning he made me low pro French toast. And I was like, okay, we're getting married. You don't know it yet, but we are. <laughs> that's, that's it. All right. <laughs> that's a great story. David? Um, so my fiance and I have actually been together for six years now. Um, but we, when we first started, we actually met online. So I guess more modern-ish couple. We did the whole online dating thing. And I was pretty upfront with her um, with the basics. I didn't get like super in depth. Um, luckily, she was a biology major, and she's working on her doctorate in um, influenza research, so she gets the science of it. Um, so she's been really supportive the whole time. Um, the the only I, I don't want to say was a, uh, the hurdle we had to really get over was when we had to break down and discuss kids if we want kids in the future. And we pretty much came to the conclusion that you know we do want kids, but she's going to get tested to see if she's a carrier. That's and if she's a carrier. Do then we're gonna be fine adopting is the way we're gonna go. Um, not necessarily because you know you can't go through it, you can't survive, you can't thrive actually with um, MSUD, but you know, it's the healthcare system and the insurance and health insurance that has really stressed me out the past, ever since I turned 26, honestly. Because um, mm -hmm. before Obamacare in the US came about, um, I think I was 20, I was about to turn 21, um, so my mom talked to the insurance company and they said, no way in hell are we ever covering your kid. And then luckily the next year they did Obamacare and I was able to, so I was able to, my parents thought I was 26. Um, but that was a big thing my parents had to worry about because the medicine is yeah. just, just not cheap. No. Um, you can deal with it, but it's just undue stress. And I get it now much that I'm, you know, 32 now. So I've dealt with it on my own now pretty much. So I'm like, yeah, I'm still on Obamacare exchange insurance because I'm a postdoc fellow, so I don't have full time full time job, technically. So I don't have group coverage. Hopefully, I'll get that soon. But the last six years, I've been in grad school doing this job, and I'm always worried. Okay, if Obamacare goes away, what do I do for insurance? Uh, my parents, luckily, they saved very well my entire childhood ever since they've been together, and they've got money if something were to happen. And it's actually in their will if something were to happen. My, my brother and sister, I would split the money evenly, but I've got my own extra money specifically for my medical expenses if all heck breaks loose. It's like a mortgage payment if it's not under insurance. That's why I live in Massachusetts. Like, that's the only reason, not the only reason, but like I was born here too, but <laughs> like that's the, literally the one thing we have. Mass Health is a backup plan. Like if I couldn't have private insurance for any reason, Mass Health will still in the state of Massachusetts cover metabolic formula. Like it's amazing. But anyway. 
So we're here with two minutes to go. Um, and there's been no new questions, but if anyone has any questions, they can put it in the Q&A and we'll try and go through it. But is there any, any parting comments you want to leave to the audience about relationships? We kind of went from family through growing up. And I'll just go around the circle. We'll start with an A. And um, anything, you know, in, in, in got about a minute or so. What, what, what are your thoughts? It, it, that's, a, that's a good question. Of course, it's, you start with me. Uh, you know, and here I am, I, I helped organize this. So, you know, I think the biggest thing is be an advocate for yourself in whatever relationship you are in. Um, this is your health and it really all comes back to you and what you do for yourself. Um, so just, you know, make it a priority for yourself in whatever relationship you're in. Um, and, you know, I think if you take it seriously, other people will be more likely to take it seriously too. Um, and I think, I think that's the biggest thing that, that I could partake. And the low protein diet is not something that will, it, it is an obstacle, but it shouldn't rule your life too. Rachel? Eat to live, don't live to eat. That my my husband is that kind of person in a way like we do love food we watch cooking shows we, we each cook our own specialties and stuff but for family for ourselves for whatever um we're very much about sharing that role and uh not I don't know kind of making someone like like we're not all about the food. It's not like, here's this shiny photo because there are people who are like that. And I don't think I personally with MSCD could be with someone who was like really into food food. And it's not that we, we, we eat to live. We're so, you know, like we like to eat, we enjoy it around family, but um, it's about nutrition and survival, not necessarily about like indulgence so much. Right. Um, and so that, that's just me and my, our relationship with each other and food. So right. Jeffrey and Bernadette. Actually, Jeffrey is obviously low protein and he has a very almost vegan, but he, my husband loves to cook and Jeffrey is right along cooking with them and it's not vegan. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of neat to see that. So it really doesn't rule his life. It's extremely important, but uh, he's learned to, He's come a long way with cooking. It used to kind of gross him out, the high protein uh, foods, the smell and everything, and now he's mm -hmm. cooking it. So yeah. he doesn't eat it, but he can cook it. Yeah. All right. Sean? Mm -hmm. uh, just a note about relationships, I guess. Um, David mentioned earlier, like, when he was going through college, like, he met somebody who just, like, didn't understand it or didn't support his condition, like, like what's the point of trying to waste your time building a relationship with that person? I just want to echo that sentiment because it's like, you know, this condition and the restrictions that come along with it are a part of, you know, our lives. And no matter what kind of disease modifying drugs or treatments that you choose to pursue uh, throughout your life, you know, you're still going to be shaped by the experiences that you had. And somebody who can't understand that or doesn't have the sympathy or the perspective to understand that is I just think somebody who you shouldn't waste your time with um, because there are a lot of people who can be really supportive you know as all of our stories have demonstrated so just look for the people who are going to support you. D David? Um, yeah so I mean I'm just going to echo that again the one thing I would say is in relationships in school and even when you're going to for, look for jobs so with my first job interviews and I'm doing I'm lining up more job interviews in the coming months um, be pretty, um, you don't have to come out and say, I have MSUD, but, you know, relatively soon, the more upfront you are about them and sort of explain to them what it is, the more they're willing to accommodate you. Uh, my first boss, you know, I went and had the interview. It went really well. She's like, you know, is there anything else you want to tell me? I kind of want to offer you the job. And I said, well, I should just let you know, I've got this. Occasionally I, get, I can get sick very quickly. Um, and she's like, no, we'll deal with it if that happens. You know, but the more upfront you are with them about it, um, the more they're willing to help you. Lauren? Kind of echoing um, what Sean said, surround yourself with those supportive people. And bottom line, embrace, embrace what you have. It's, 
it's a part of who you are. It's not all of who you are. In the past few years, I've really tried to be an advocate for people with PKU and our allied disorders and just embrace your weirdness. It would, it's what makes you special. You need to be out there and be an advocate for yourself. And if you are able, be an advocate for other people who might not be brave enough to. Well, I, I will kind of round it out with this. And anyone who's in, in here listening, if you sat through the whole hour and if you have younger kids with uh, rare disease or an allied disorder, um, what I heard was everybody's story got better. Everybody's story got better. As they got older, it got better. So no matter where you are in this journey, it gets better. And it's important to remember that too. Today is not every day. Every day will get better. Um, 